Hey, hey, this is Carlos. I'm the CEO at Product School, and today I'm here with Jeff Cho, who's the CEO at InVision. Hey, Jeff. Hey, Carlos. How are you doing? Good to have you on the show. Again, it was fun to have you on stage at ProductCon New York a few months ago, and I um, want to continue the conversation uh, because InVision is one of those iconic products that have been around for a very long time, uh, very much loved by product people. So excited to, to learn more about your own trajectory. So let's start from the very beginning. I see that you are the CEO, but you kind of grew into that, right? So what is your story? How did you grow from your first PM job all the way up to CEO? Yeah. Uh, th first of all, thanks for having me. And it, it was a blast at ProductCon. Um, a ton of fun just seeing all the amazing product leaders coming into one place. Um, yeah, my personal journey is, I don't know if it's original, It's uh, but you know, it, it's definitely had its twists and turns. Um, I started my career very entrepreneurial. So um, right out of, uh, right during the dot-com bust, actually, right, 2000, um, after graduating school, um, I started a, a company and, and basically I went on to uh, being a little bit of a serial entrepreneur. So I founded, co-founded and exited uh, several startups, one in the marketing automation space, another one in mobile advertising, and then another one in consumer space. So real diversity of interests. And I really kind of honed my product sensibilities and skills by attacking many different problems uh, to solve there. Um, and then I worked at a lot of scaled companies, right? And so I led product for Google Play Newsstand at Google. Um, and then that is now uh, known as Google News. And then I also led product and product design at TripAdvisor, uh, their core business unit. So a lot of uh, great experience now from zero to one startups to kind of really at scale uh, opportunities. And around three years ago, I joined Envision um, and I served as the chief product officer and worked closely with our founder and CEO, Clark Wahlberg. And then uh, six months ago, I uh, agreed uh, to take over the helm as CEO. Well this is very refreshing and validating for a lot of other product people out there. Recently, we saw how the CEO of YouTube was a former chief product officer. Uh, you were the chief product officer at Envision. It's really amazing. I call it product CEOs because I've been explaining that the, a lot of the skills actually can transfer and you can treat your company as a product in a good way. So I, I want to ask you, since you are also now a CEO, like, you know, there's been a lot of misconceptions around or the... Is, is this product manager the CEO of the product? So in your own experience, what are some of those pieces that stay true? And what are some of the pieces that now you, you realize as a, as a CEO, not just at Envision, but in your previous entrepreneurial journeys that are actually quite different from being a PM? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I always kind of pause when, we, and when people say product manager is the CEO because it sort of... Um, you, you definitely want to approach things more holistically, but then if you squint, it's kind of true, right? Like product managers and the great product leaders solve problems, right? And they look to deliver business impact. And the way they have to do it is to take many different cross-functional teams, pull them together to create magic, right? And I think that's all about um, setting pace, solving problems, and being like probably the best communicator of those business imperatives such that they get everyone aligned and everyone participating in solving those problems. And so what I've seen uh, through my career is um, the the product as CEO definitely is true. Generally speaking, it's for companies where the product is the business more or less, right? You know, if you're if you're at one that has more kind of supply chain, you know, other things that are more holistic, then maybe not. But ultimately, um, as a product uh, manager grows into product leadership, they take bigger and bigger responsibilities, but their muscle that they're creating is the same, right? Better communication, better problem solving, pulling in disparate leaders, setting pace. And that's ultimately... You know, I've seen a lot of product leaders turn into GMs of business units and then ultimately uh, turn into CEOs as well. So it, it, is an, it's a, it is not an atypical kind of track. One thing I noticed since we started uh, our company nine years ago is that product management is, is not a secret anymore. We went from people asking, what is a product manager? How do I become one to, okay, it's very clear that product is important, that there's a product team in many companies, that a chief product officer, and, and now there's this need for more clarity in terms of the, what is that career ladder? What is the actual role 
of product. Is this like a nice to have or is it a must have? And one thing I noticed as you know, we've, we've navigated multiple crises, right? Like you mentioned the mm-hmm. pandemic, uh, there's been a, a potential recession is what is, how what would be a good way for product people to actually show value beyond just being the advocate of the user. Many of the people who are working in product today, they've never lived through a recession. They've only been in companies that are in hyper growth mode. And now they are forced to making other types of decisions. So what's your take on that? Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's um, uh, a really great point, right? We are in one of those amazing moments in time where we can kind of let go of the the previous generation traits of like, join the rocket ship. This is amazing. You know, oh, can't can't wait. This, you know, boom. And really um, the value of a product manager is uh, delivering business impact uh, with all of the facts, right? And the facts today are that everyone needs to kind of figure out how do you kind of communicate that the value, the imperative, the business impact. Potentially, you have to go to switch really quickly from growth at all costs to path to profitability. These are all things that, while it is a business imperative, ev- every product leader, if they can in- infuse that why and what of the business to their team and have them solve those problems, they are directly aligned to di- driving that impact, right? So for an example, um, at Envision, we have a product called Freehand, right? And it is a great uh, visual collaboration platform that we are driving towards getting everyone to, to work a little bit better together. And there's an amazing user value, right? Uh, we have uh, hundreds of th- thousands of users who are telling us how great they love it and they're, they're really excited about the next, you know, features that we're unlocking. But, you know, one thing that we've been really pushing on is it's not just customer value isn't just user delight and user value, but what is the business value, right? And one one area that we're uh, working through is talking about the buyer value, right? And how do you understand ROI? You know, if we're really unlocking cross-functional behavior, how do you actually articulate that and then manifest that within a feature set that can deliver the same impact for the user, but also really solve the, the actual problem for a business. So, you know, we're talking to a lot of IT buyers and IT buyers, as we know today, are really constrained on, on their budget and they're trying to figure out how to manage their SaaS spend, right? And so now you're actually switching to trying to um, articulate the same value, but to the, a different audience. So a lot of different switches for uh, leaders, especially in product management. Love that concept. We've been implementing that internally as well, because I think sometimes the terms of user value can be misunderstood as being the enemy of sales or being the enemy of providing actual business value in the short term. And, and I think it's time for, for product people, for product teams to really step up. And even if you don't own PL directly, to really have an eye on how certain features are really impacting the bottom line. Because ultimately, if that business value is not connected to uh, if that user value that PMs are building is not connected to business value, there's just not enough time for sometimes in, in especially these type of scenarios for for those PMs to have an opportunity to, to show. Like and, the, the, and it's kind of a, a blessing and a course at the same time. But yeah. uh, I think it's an opportunity for a lot of product teams to show that this is just not a nice to have. It's not just for high tech companies that really care about customers. It's really for everybody. And P a product needs to be really driving business value, not just user value. 100%. And, and in fact, I, the reason I'm so excited about this kind of age that we're living in right now and kind of um, that level of rigor and discipline is product leaders are going to grow so fast now. <laughs> you know, before you could say like, I ran an A-B test, it was up 3%, I did my job and I'm done. You know, now you you actually have to, you are now the keeper of a large cost center where you are going to engineers and designers and user researchers and copywriters and everyone else and saying like, hey, if you are successful in articulating the business imperative for your organization and getting people to really solve it, you're cascading the problem solving to many different very specialized disciplines who are going to help you solve that even better. And the best product leaders that I've ever worked with are the ones who can translate that really quickly. And when they do, magic happens, right? Before it was like magic is like, oh, that was a really delightful UX, you know, change. But now it's like, okay, it's not just ma- magic, but you can actually tie it directly to a PL, 
right? And that's a, that is a huge opportunity for every single product leader out there. So for you, Jeff, I know Envision has been around for a long time, even before there was a dedicated category for product technology. I remember I, was, I am a user still, but like way back when, even before I started the company, I was yeah. using Envision. And I remember it being just an A product, yeah. mostly focused on designers. Now, as you mentioned, it's a platform, it's a portfolio of products, and there's clear use cases for product teams. So I want to learn more about that evolution. Like how did you go from one product to a portfolio of products, including different type of customers? Yeah, hundred percent. You know, I, I think you, you mentioned product school has been around for nine years and I think we've beat you by a year or two. So um, <laughs> that's a the great opportunity. But yeah, Envision has been over around for over a decade. You know, what has stayed true for us is our mission. Right. And our mission has always been to help teams do their best work together. Right. And so, you know, you're right. It started with design you know, and design practices. But the value that we were providing is how do you bring and get a designer to have a seat at the table and work collaboratively with product engineering uh, stakeholders to kind of do the best work possible to have design and digital transformation really be the imperative. Um, and so, you know, we've taken that mission and really pushed it forward. And, and you know, through the pandemic, we, we realized that a lot of teams were starting to use us specifically freehand um, beyond just kind of the EP and D uh, groups, right? And so we took that signal and ran with it. And now we are uh, really pushing beyond that to full organizations. And with freehand, you know, we're helping thousands of our enterprise customers empower their teams to brainstorm, ideate, and act really cross-functional work. All right. And so, you know, when we think about uh, product suites and product portfolios, it's really all about um, staying true to your mission and thinking about the most outsized impact you can have on that mission. And I will say our core mission is cross-functional work. Right. And if you think about it, um, the, the entire history of technology has been solving functional work. Right. To design, to code to sell. And there's a lot of like collaboration layers that have gone on top of that where people can review and comment. But if you take like two steps to the left of that process is the messy work, right? That's where, in, and again, this is where product managers really kind of live and breathe is like, okay, well, what is it that we're gonna design? What is it that we're gonna code? What is it that we're gonna sell? And that usually is a bunch of people sitting together to brainstorm and ideate um, and solve that. And so, we don't think that that's actually been cracked. And we think that is the most transformative opportunity for workplace productivity is getting people to do that. And the reason it hasn't been cracked is it includes psychology, right? It's actually like, how do you get an introverted engineer to understand the problem to solve, but also participate in the generative moments of ideation, right? As opposed to just sitting there quietly. These are like the real key kind of things that we're looking out to solve. And it's so hard because I've seen this I think a similar movie with other companies. They crack the code for a very specific need in a function. In this case, could be design, right? Remember, I was using the interactive mm -hmm. typing product. That was awesome, right? I was able to upload images, create some animations, and quickly test my MVPs with different users. We've seen other companies that try to solve for engineers first or marketers first, and then eventually they want to become a platform that is more of a painkiller for for the entire organization or, or for more functions within mm -hmm. the organization. So you guys took multiple steps to grow beyond design and now beyond product. But here is the but. When you started with your first product, pretty much found product market fit. You were the, the leader in that space and that helped tremendously. When you make another move in a, in a space where there are other players, how do you think about you know, balancing, your, balancing your resources and also your own strategy because, you know, like, yes, freehand has a lot of potential, mm -hmm. yet it's, it's, it's probably harder to adopt for other companies that already have a similar solution. Yeah, you know, I, I think this is one of those uh, areas where for leaders 
out there. You know, the the real opportunity here is that everyone disrupts everything all the time, <laughs> right? You know, I will be the first to admit that Figma did a great job disrupting Envision around the design space, and uh, you know, and we were both beneficial. You know, our designers use Figma, but also you know, an opportunity where we can look beyond just design and see how we can how we can play, right? Um, you know, w one thing that we've realized is that when we talk to our users, including design users, what they really value ab us about is having that democratized space where they can get all their work, uh, both cogently given feedback, but also taking one step away on those messy moments to kind of expand. So we listened to our customers, right? And we said, okay, you know, what we want to do is make sure that we are uh, expanding this. So, you know, designers around the world are using us to not just prototype and get uh, feedback on their hi-fi designs, but are doing what all the other design disciplines have, right? It's about the user feedback loops. It's about the journey maps. It's about, you know, working through the requirements and getting those user experiences down, down pat. Um, what we're realizing is the white space, and this is about all of product leadership uh, navigating this, is, you know, unless you're innovating and challenging, it's really hard to kind of succeed, right? And so, you know, with Freehand, what we've realized is, you know, there is an opportunity because most of our competitors have started out as being departmental tools. So highly complex, they've gotten the facilitators or you've got others, you've got toolbars all on every single axis of the uh, experience. But what is cross-functional uh, uh, leadership uh, par participation need? You need the most inclusive experience where anybody, even the, the most normal knowledge worker out there, can look at it in a split second, pick it up and not feel scared, right? And so, you know, we are actually the number one easiest to use uh, visual collaboration tool by G2 because we've done that intentionally. We want, you know, anybody cross-functionally looking to work, they should be able to participate directly. Uh, I believe that. I think one of the things that make you guys unique is the fact that your founding team had a really strong background in design. Like yeah. Most of the other companies that I've seen around come from a technical background or product background, business. But like having that eye for design is huge. And I'm not surprised. You know, it's an easy to use product. Now, but here's, the, here's the thing. As, you, as you're branching out, you are having like bigger conversations. You move up market. Like Envision was doing product-led growth even before product-led growth had a label. <laughs> yeah. you know, like I remember mm -hmm. signing up for free and inviting people to use the product. How do you go about creating or expanding that experience so hopefully some of those champions, right, designers, PMs, can involve other people within the organization and not just in increase the usage of a specific feature, but potentially branch out into adopting net new products? Yeah, you know... I I think there's like a really interesting aspect around product-led growth, which is uh, everything's about nuance now, especially nowadays, right? You know, we have this amazing go-to-market team, right? Uh, probably what I would say is the best customer success team, the best sales team. And they build these amazing relationships directly um, with customers, buyers, uh, decision makers. And then we have a, a, a product-led growth engine where we're meeting the needs of users um, uh, throughout the organization. Now, by design, our product is cross-functional, right? Solving very specific business processes where you have to invite, you know, someone else to the table, right? And so, you know, one thing that we we actually uh, discovered throughout building our experience and figuring this out is it wasn't actually a feature at all that was uh, limiting kind of the growth. It was a business model. Right, and the business model that we are we discovered is that SaaS-based business model is a per seat pricing model, right? And the the number one limiting friction for user adoption was being considering like, should we invite that person because then we might have to pay for that seat, and that's completely in conflict with um, with uh, cross-functional collaboration, right? Uh, you know what we say internally is. There are no toll booths to a conference room, right? So why should there be one on your visual collaboration tool? So, you know, we've actually, we went from that discovery, which is a product-led discovery, right? To then say like, okay, let's elevate that to a business imperative, which is how do we actually be inclusively priced 
so that no one thinks about cost when inviting things. So we actually introduced a new pricing model where we are now 50% that of Miro and Miro. But even more importantly, we actually have these new pricing models like, um, like flat rate pricing or others where it makes it such that anybody in the organization can pick it up without a huge amount of kind of gating to for, you know, or stress from the admin that they're going to be re true up, uh, up the wazoo. Right. And so, you know, I think that's a, a classic example of maybe uh, product leadership where when you're really trying to solve a problem, even if you're in the growth team trying to do product led growth, if you discover any signal that is an impediment, how do you ele elevate that to kind of a conversation that might not be your remit in your lane, but that's where I think product leadership really grows is when people start you know, sharing those signals and really getting people to think differently. I think it's a great example of connecting user value with business value. Right? Like I'm sure probably the initial discovery wasn't around, let's change the business model of the company, but right. <laughs> it was something <laughs> that were telling you there's more here than just you know, uh, tweaking the price here and there. And, and that's what I love about product. And I, I want to jump into the pricing aspect to it here because we, we are, I'm seeing a trend in B2B SaaS where it's, it's, it's more about the, the actual usage not so much as capping a certain feature. It's like mm -hmm. maybe you can use a feature a little bit just to get value and then you can decide if you really want to go for the next tier. So in your case, I get that it's obviously a forever free plan and that there is no cap in terms of how many free team members mm -hmm. you can bring to the platform. But at what point or what are your, your level levels levers to bring you know, a decision maker into the, the room and potentially become a pain killer for across different functions. Yeah, you know, we have um, a tremendous amount of systems to, to, you know, understand where those inflection points are. But, you know, fundamentally, our first principle is um, do not gate the user from a functionality that will get them to the aha moment, right? You know, and we want to make sure that every, you, because, you know, what we're trying to do is disrupt different types of kind of business processes. And we are not uh, going to figure out which is the one that's predominantly should be gated or not. And others, people have to discover and make it their own, their workflows. So, you know, we really have a very liberal sense that goes all the way through pro. Um, there, there is a clear line of demarcation for enterprise organizations, right? Highly security conscious, you know, we have been through the paces, right? Every FinServe uh, organization. Uh, if you haven't gone through a security review with a FinServe organization, then let me tell you, once you go through, you feel like you can flip a car. You're, you're so like supercharged. But, you know, we've been through the paces so that we know that like there are certain tiers of organizations as they scale and grow, they have new requirements. And so we basically try to align at its simplest form. You know, we don't want to confuse people. We don't want to have this a la carte thing saying like, oh, this will be the next gate. This will be the other gate. You know, you keep it simple, keep it uh, transparent. And so we've really kind of focused on, on those levers and aspects and then just trusted that we, uh, as we're going after bigger and bigger organizations and sizes, you know, that's where our team um, can understand the funnel. Right. Like it's no longer the how many people need to hit this feature. Great. This is an this is a PQL. Let's go after it. Right. Like it's less that. And now more we're, we're really seeing like the the opportunity size elevate for our enterprise team. And uh, you mentioned before that uh, Envision has been around for over 10 years, probably before product management was cool. And uh, one of the other things that you guys did before it was cool was working remotely. I remember uh, you were one of the pioneers uh, in terms of company size that was experimenting with a remote first approach. And this is way before the pandemic. So I want to learn more about your own experience doing that and like what are some of the changes that you did at your current scale to make sure that this is something that can be sustainable. Yeah, absolutely. You know, a fun fact, I joined uh, Envision during the pandemic, right? And so, and, um, and I actually found it very difficult because uh, for those who had a uh, job change during the pandemic, when you first got into the pandemic and you had your first taste of working remote, uh, it was easy because you already built the relationships. And then you joined the pan during the pandemic, it was a little bit more difficult. And one thing that I found talking to the team, especially like the OG, you know, teams at Envision is 
they're like, no, 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 no. This isn't remote work, right? This is like you're trapped and you can never see each other in person, right? And they would tell me these stories of how Envision really, really figured it out, right? It was is intentionally having moments. It was remote first, right? It wasn't remote only, right? And so it was intent, being intentional to have moments to meet up. It was in being intentional, intentional to have moments of kind of real relationship building. And then all the benefits of working remote, right? We're being a focus, not having kind of all the like stress, uh, work-life stress of getting home to get your kid to the soccer practice and all these other things actually were a huge positive. And so, you know, what we've learned is um, over time is one, uh, remote work is fantastic. And I, I, pro I will never change, right? But you have to have intentional moments of meeting each other in person, building those uh, um, relationships and, and figuring out where you can kind of, where it actually makes sense to do things in person. I just believe the ratios are completely, you know, inverted where you can get to like an 80-20 split or like an, even a 90-10 split and still be uh, way more effective than like forced in person. Um, the second thing is really tooling, right? Like I do think the thing that we uh, we have learned through, you know, building Freehand and others is that making sure that you actually have the right tools in place to do the work, right? more a well, we're completely globally distributed right so like asynchronous work is more important than you know meetings being really mindful of giant meetings where you know slowly you see the brady bunch grid and then all of a sudden people start going off screen <laughs> slowly and then you're like oh i just lost the entire room right like these are things that you know are frankly in-person issues that are just amplified remote right like i mean who hasn't had a giant meeting in person where you lose half the room and everyone starts opening their laptops. It's the same thing, right? And so that just means you're not being an effective leader, right? And so like, these are things that we've just learned over time in terms of making it a little bit easier to kind of work better together. And now we have an amazing rhythm, right? Like it's, it's a very fluid, very iterative, uh, uh, people are really kind of black belt in communication. Um, and it's just a, a great experience. Can you give me an idea of like, um, stats and like you said you're globally distributed like uh, countries or continents being represented in your company oh yeah that i you know i wish i could it's um but you know we are we are in all the you know you know north america south america europe uh asia africa you know like we have basically members in in all of the regions you know we have the general kind of clustering right in like the major cities um Amsterdam, UK, London, um, you know, New York, San Fran, but, you know, generally speaking, it, we really are all over the place. And then just to wrap up, obviously, I cannot go without asking about AI, right? In the times where everybody's trying to throw AI to their product, I just want to get your hot take on um, how you guys are experimenting with AI. Yeah. Um, so we are, you know, so we recently introduced uh, the concept of the intelligent canvas, right? And really, this is our foray to say, you know, the future of um, work uh, has to make sure that you, the what you put on the canvas in our case to do work has to do way more, give you more value back than the effort you put in, right? And, you know, today's tools are really a great unlock for having real-time multiplayer experiences, but also a lot of information all in one place. Um, but what we need, we need to do is to actually have that work, do the work for you as well. And so we're, we're thrilled with um, um, the work we're both we're doing and the opportunity. So the Intelligent Canvas is actually offering more structured information on the, on the canvas. Things are able to kind of work. Uh, the data can talk to each other. They can actually interact with each other. So, things like uh, capacity planning or resource planning. And then, what we're going to be introducing is uh, using artificial intelligence to kind of do things even more. You know, so if you think about a lot of the cross functional work, synthesis, right? Um, areas that are really pushing the bounds. For product management, I think this is one of those amazing opportunities where. You know, what is the superpower of a even like a, a senior PM or a PM, right? It's really pushing on the aspect of like, you know, is your strength writing the product brief, right? Is it really the like your ability to write prose? 
or is it should you be spending your effort getting like the top in triaging the top requirements understanding and consolidating those themes making sure they're right but then outputting into a one pager that people could read and where can actually ai help and simplify those processes right synthesis for user research all these other things like all the tools that every product manager is watching this right now if you can think of the things that you do repetitively where you're just rolling your eyes being like, man, I just want to slam my head into the keyboard right now. That's what I, AI can solve, right? What it cannot solve is your point of view on how do you take those bodies of work where you're hearing from every stakeholder and every uh, functional leader that you're working with and to boil that down to the thing that you're solving and the business impact it's going to have, right? And so that's you. That's the skill set you need to hone. Everything else, AI is going to make you... Uh, Supercharged. You're gonna be a superhero because of it. Totally. I don't think AI is going to replace the product managers by any means. They can no. supercharge their impact for sure. Uh, Jeff, it's been awesome to have you on the show. Thank you so much for your time. Absolutely. Thanks, Carlos.